Hey, just grateful that you are here. Uh, we got people watching all over uh, locally, people from Fayetteville, people from Colonial Heights, Prince George, California, uh, just all over. Thank you guys for joining us online. And again, thank you for those in the simulcast uh, room as well. Uh, and, uh, and thank you guys for showing up Wednesday. Come on, anybody have a great time Wednesday night? Uh, it was a powerful time. Uh, you know, revival is not about one night. Revival is about what God wants to continue to do in us. Uh, but I am grateful and thankful for what God did Wednesday night and just showed up and showed out. Um, and God's doing great, great things in our church. And uh, I'm wrapping up a series today called Set Apart because that's exactly who we are. How many know God is setting us apart for something powerful and something great? Um, we should be so thankful for all God is doing today. My wife is uh, with so many volunteers today, busy, uh, not just serving pancakes uh, to kids, but serving Jesus to kids. Um, I've got a friend of mine in North Carolina. He's a pastor, but he helps. Uh, he's got a thing on, on the side, a church growth thing on the side to help churches get over 200 people. You know, most churches in America are under 200 people. Uh, and so he works really, really hard to help coach guys and uh, to get their churches over 200 people. Well, last Sunday, uh, y'all, we had over four, almost 400 kids at church last Sunday. Come on, somebody. 400 kids. Somebody say COVID babies. All right, man, we got so many babies. COVID babies. All right. Some of y'all taking be fruitful, multiply to another level. Uh, but um, all, we're thankful for what God's doing in our kids' ministry and uh, thankful for what God's doing in our youth ministry, over 200 some at, at youth retreat. And uh, even Wednesday night, you know, we were praying for God to fill people with the Holy Spirit. I had a chance, uh, even while we were praying in the altars, I was praying for some teenage uh, men, young men. It was so cool. And I was praying for three or four of them. One of them I was praying for, it wasn't sure uh, uh, he was saved. Asked him and had a chance to lead him to the Lord. Gave his life to Jesus uh, Wednesday night. And just cool to see what God is, is just doing in people's life. And uh, how many just believe that this is not normal what God is doing? This is uh, extraordinary, and we give God all the praise and glory for it. Um, and as we wrap up this series, just want to remind you of our theme verse, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, but you, Destination Church, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Destination, you are God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the light. Can we just declare his praises today? And as we wrap this series up, I want you to understand that declaring the praises of God is not just something we do on Sundays. As a matter of fact, the people who really need you to hear that the declaring the praises of God is not in a church building, it's people outside the church. You know, we need to go out of here declaring that he brought us out of darkness into light. Every day we work with people or go to school with people, live in neighborhoods with people that are still living in darkness, that need a healing, need a miracle, need peace, need joy. And you and I have that. And if God has done something for you, how many know we have a responsibility not to hide that light or to keep that testimony, but to declare the goodness of the Lord? And so we know that God has set us apart for a calling, not to have a holy huddle. Come on, y'all, we're not a club in here. We are a mission and an army that is called by God to be set apart to do something. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we, everybody say we, we. for we are God's masterpiece. Think about this. God didn't call the Grand Canyon a masterpiece. He didn't call the Swiss Alps a masterpiece. He didn't call the Atlantic Ocean a masterpiece. He called you and I a masterpiece. God made all those things too. But then he says, you, you are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things, the good things he planned for us long ago. I think it's time we start doing the things that he planned for us to do. Uh, we've set aside the month of January, but now we're in the month of February. And as we go into this year, I just want to encourage you this, that you will never find your peace and joy and fulfillment until you walk in the ordained steps that God has for you. Yeah. Let me tell you, you could get every great job, earn every great paycheck. Uh, you can gain the whole world and let, yet lose your soul. Uh, you will never find true uh, a meaning and purpose in life until you do the things you were created to do. Um, but you can't do what you're called to do until you know the one who called you and created you. But God has made us for something bigger than ourselves. And, and not only did God create us to do good things, you have an enemy. I have an enemy. We have an enemy that wants to get us off that mission. 
Uh, the enemy wants to do everything he can to steal, kill, and destroy our calling, our purpose, our identity. Uh, but one of the things that the enemy is really good at uh, is just trying to separate his people from their God. And what I mean by that is that the enemy is really sneaky um, at putting things between you and God. Uh, the enemy is really, really good at causing things to come between us and our Father to help us just kind of create that distance. Because the more distance between you and God, uh, the less likely you're going to really know him or walk in the purposes and calling that he has for you. And you'll start to question God. And you'll start to think, God, where are you? And many times God didn't move. We moved. And many times we allow things to come in, and, and, and uh, I just want you to know today uh, is that that's not how God not only created us, there's nothing in this world. Let me ask you this question. What is separating you from God today? What is separating you from the, the purposes of God? Let me just tell you, there's really nothing that can separate you from God. Look, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us? The other word could be the, what shall separate us? What shall separate us from the love of Christ Jesus? Uh, shall trouble or hardship. If you keep reading that verse, it says, well, persecution or famine. There's just a list of things because we think many times that if we go through a difficult time, that somehow God is not in the midst of our difficult time. Or we think sometimes when God's not speaking that God's not working. Let me remind some of you uh, many times this. It's hard sometimes for us to do this. Uh, it's hard for us to work and talk sometimes at the same time. I want to encourage you, if you don't feel like God's speaking, don't think he's absent. Just remind yourself, if God's not talking, he's probably working on your behalf. Even when you can't see it, God is working. And many times it's in the valleys, not always on the mountaintops, that God shows himself and grows us. And I'm just here to tell you, what, what can separate us? What, look, look at this. No, Paul says. Everybody say no. no. Look at verse 37. He's saying no to all these things. And all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The title of my message today is really simple. As we wrap this series up, I want you to know that you and I were made for more. You and I were made for more. Can you tell your neighbor that? Come on, you were made for more. I, I want to remind Destination Church, Destiny, we are made for more. Uh, my, I was reminded this week, uh, my mom, back when we were at the theater uh, at Regal uh, years ago, she kind of prophesied that destination is destined for the nations. Do you know that this day, Pastor Doug, and we have a whole team of people that have been serving in, in Africa this week, and Wednesday night, I had someone from Africa speaking to us. Come on, somebody. We are destined. We are destined for the nations. Even in this room, did you know there are people from all over the world that are in this room right now? Uh, in this little town of Hopewell, come on, sometimes we forget that God can do big things in small places sometimes. How, I mean, oh, God is not restricted to your past. He's not restricted to your environment. Don't put God in a box. You can't put God in a box. God wants to do more. You are not a victim of your past. You are not who you are right now. Come on, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Come on, somebody say more. We, we are made for more. Don't you want more? Is there something inside of you that just wants more? Like, like, you, just, like you have this desire for more. Um, and I don't mean in a greedy way. I mean, if you love God and you serve God, uh, that there's just something in you that desires just for something more, so, more influence, more open doors, more, more blessing on your kids, a blessed marriage, like you have maybe job increase, and there's nothing wrong. Uh, not only is there nothing wrong with wanting more, I believe God created you to want more and to walk in more. But not more of the things of this world, more of the things of God. And God, and I think the enemy, here, here, lean in today. The enemy knows that you and I were created for more. And so he's going to try to constantly make you think about less. Or if he can't do that, try to get you bogged down with wanting more of things that are not of God than of God. But I just know this, that God created us for more. And I, I know today that God wants to reveal his purposes in our life. And, and if nothing can separate us from God, then how do we walk in more? Um, I want you now to open with me to Ephesians chapter 3. This is the, the main part of where I want to be today. Ephesians chapter 3, I believe that God wants to reveal his purposes in us, that God wants us to do more. Uh, look at verse number 10. It says, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church 
to display his wisdom and its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. God wants to use our church to display his wisdom, his power, his presence, his anointing, his grace. Now, in your pocket right now, there might be a display. When you get home, you may watch something on your wall that is a display. But I need to remind you, the greatest display is not in your pocket, it's you. Did you know that every one of you are a walking billboard displaying something? Do you know God wants to use you to display something to this world that would cause this world to want to see God, know God, and believe for something more? But let me ask you this. As people walk past you, drive past you, work with you, what are you displaying to them? I wonder how many people look at you and be like, uh, next, I don't want any more of that. <laughs> my, my prayer is that we live our lives in such a way that when people see us, they may not know what it is, but they say, I want more of that. They've got peace, I want some. They got love, I want some. They've got power, I want some. God wants to use destination to display his unique wisdom and power to a world that desperately needs it. Look at this. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now look at the next line. If I was taking notes, I, I, by the way, I would. I, I would write down or underline the next verse. It says, because of Christ and, everybody say and, and. our faith in him. Because of Christ and our faith in him. Do you know there's a unique divine partnership between us and Jesus? You know, Revelation says it like this. We overcome. How many know we are more than conquerors? We overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. We overcome by what Jesus did and by what we believe about what Jesus did. We overcome by Jesus Christ and our faith in him. Let me tell you, Jesus already did his part. Are we doing our part? Jesus came, he died, he rose from the dead, and God is wanting to do more in your life, but there is a partnership that has to happen. We've got to want more. We've got to have more faith. We've got to have a more uh, mentality when it comes to God. He goes, now we can come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Now look at verse 16. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you. Everybody say empower. empower. He wants to empower you with inner strength. Through what? His spirit. It's one of the things we've been praying for. We prayed Wednesday night for a baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need the spirit of God. There is no holiness without the Holy Spirit. There is no power without the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by my might, not by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Now it goes on to say this, then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust him. Now look at this. Your roots will grow down into God's love. And keep you strong. You, you know, I, every one of you have roots. Every single one of you. The question is, where are those roots going down? Are they going down into the things of this world? Or are they going down into the love of God? Psalms 1 says, may we be like a tree planted by living waters that produces fruit in every season. Did, did you know this? You know, most trees don't plant, I mean, don't produce fruit in every season. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you know what that means? If you are planted into the living water, that in your good seasons, you're producing fruit. In your dry seasons, you're producing fruit. In the hard times, you are as fruitful in the good times. Come on. How many of you want to produce fruit in every season? And, and by the way, not only should you produce fruit, those storms should not knock you over. They should make you stronger. One of the words that the Lord told me about this church this year is that God was taking our roots deeper to make us more resilient. We, we got too many Christians that look great on the outside, but they have no roots going down on the inside. And when a, when a wind blows, we fall right over. One offense, we fall over. One distraction, we fall over. One mistake, we fall over. One bad week, and it turns into two bad weeks. But God is looking for people that though they stumble, they will rise because their roots are so deep that they will produce fruit in every single season. God, God is developing that in you and in us. Why? May you have the power, the power to understand, as all God people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Too many of you know about the love of Jesus, you just haven't experienced it. 
What I mean by that is that the true love of Jesus is an unconditional love. Do you know the love of Jesus is something that you cannot earn? You, don't, you cannot earn your way to heaven? Listen, Jesus doesn't love you more when you are a better person. Jesus doesn't stop loving you when you make mistakes. The love of Jesus is a, is a covering for all of our, our sins. The love of Jesus is so unconditional. And when you experience that love, you stop trying to perform for Jesus, and you just start to produce for Jesus. God is wanting to do something so powerful in our church that, yes, we'll produce fruit, but we don't have to perform for God. Can, can I tell you, God's wanting to do something real, even though it's too great to understand fully. Then you'll may be made complete with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, verse 20, I want to land on this verse. Now, all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. I want you to say that verse out loud with me today by faith. Come on. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Come on, say it so the devil can hear you today. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Come on, how many know we are made for more? We are made for more. We are made for more. Listen, here's the one thing to know. God is working in us so he can do more through us. Let me say it again. God wants to work in us so he can do more through us. The problem is we want God to do big things for us, we just don't allow him to do big things in us. We want God to open doors for us, but we don't open doors in us. We, we want God to, to do great miracles and, and favor and signs and wonders, and we want God to bless us on the outside. We just don't let God in all the places on the inside. Uh, I know this, that God has more, wants to do more. He created you for more, but he needs more access to you on the inside. It is through his unlimited power, his unlimited resources at work within us so that he can do more than we could ever ask, imagine, or think. How, how many of you want God to do more? Come on, how many of you want God to do more? Well, listen, if you want God to do more, then we need to give God more access to us. If you want God to do more public things, you need to let God do more private things. If you want God to do more outside of you, you need to let God do more inside of you. The more open you are to God, the more God can do things through you. And let me just say this, God wants to do great things for you, but he'd rather do something in you first so he can do something real through your life. And so we need to do more. Come on, somebody say, we need more. We need more. Now, let, let me just say this. I, I prayed about this, and I feel like the Lord for our church um, just said this by faith, that if we'll do three things more, and this is all by faith, that God will do more in us and through us if we'll give him access to three things that we'll do more of. I want to give you all three, then I want to teach on them. Here, here's what they are. God said this, um, more humble, more humble, more hungry, and more obedient. God is asking Destination Church to be more humble, more hungry, and more obedient. Say it with me if you can do it. God wants us to be more humble, more hungry, and more obedient. I, I know by faith, if we'll walk in these three things, that God wants to do something powerful in our church, through our church, in your life, more than you could ever imagine, ask, or think of. But we got to give God access to more. Here's the first one. God will do more when we are more humble. Let me say it again. God will do more when we are more humble. Humble. Now, let me just say this. This is a position, if I had to give a, a, a physical impression of humility, uh, this is kind of a position of humility. It's the, it's the outward sign of a servant, someone who's there to serve. But let me first say this. Um, before servanthood ever hits your hands, your feet, your mouth, your ears, it's got to start right here in your heart. 
And this is all about heart access, not anything on the outside first. And um, our culture, listen, our culture is so big. You need to really allow, be careful who you allow to speak into your life. Because you may think someone's there to help you, but can I tell you, if, if anyone is encouraging you to do anything but be a servant, they do not have your best interests in mind. Let me say that again. You know, you know what servants do? They give up their rights. Everything in our culture is stand for your rights, let everybody know you fight for who you are, all those things. And you'll gain the world and yet lose your soul. And you may get things for yourself and literally repel the spirit of God that wants to do more in your life. You'll be more like your father, the devil, than your father, God. Now, think about, think about the devil. What did the devil do? The devil, what did he do? He, he, instead of taking a low position, he thought he was higher than God, tried to go above God, and what did God ultimately do? Take him down to the, you know, no one will ever be lower than the devil. Even people that go to hell will not be as low as the devil. Now, what did Jesus do? Jesus, whose name was already above all names, humbled himself and became a servant, left heaven, came to earth, took on the, the act of a criminal, even though he committed no sin, he was completely innocent, didn't stand up for his rights, literally let people falsely kill him and murder him, put him in a grave. He humbled himself, Philippians chapter 2 says, became obedient even to the point of death, yet God exalted him and gave him a name that is above all other names, that at his name every knee will now bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So who are you going to follow, the example of Jesus or the example of the devil? Let me t tell you this. When you walk in humility, here's what it does. Humility literally does this. It's actually a, a, almost like a gravitational pull to the grace of God on your life. The more humble you are, it's almost like God can't help but anoint you and bless you and lift you up. It's almost like the more you stop talking about yourself, the more God starts talking about you. The more you, you start pushing others up, the more God starts pushing you up. The more you make it about you, God's going to let it be about you. You're going to be on your own. But when you, when you humble yourself, uh, this is why 2 Chronicles 7 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Do you know prayer is the greatest form of humility there is? Do you know why people don't pray? People don't, you know, like, listen, it's not because you don't have time. It's not because you don't know how. It's that pride and prayer cannot coexist. Wow. Wow. Because here's what I think. I think the thing that keeps people from praying is a spirit of pride. The Lord actually convicted me of this back in December. Um, I, I feel like the Lord told me I need to start asking people to pray for me more. Like pray when I travel, pray when I preach. I, I texted somebody this morning, hey, I'm preaching today, traveling later this afternoon. Would you cover me in prayer? And you say, well, what's the big deal? I felt like the Lord said you didn't do that because of, of a layer of pride that was in your heart. Think about this. When you ask people, you know, if you just ask most people, hey, can I pray with you? Or is there anything I can pray with you about? You catch them when they're not spiritual. Hey, is there anything I can pray with you about? No, I'm good. No, I'm good. Oh, I don't need the almighty God. No, I don't need him. Oh, you? I definitely don't need you. Oh, you don't need, the, you don't need more wisdom. You don't need more anointing. You don't need more grace. You don't need more favor. You don't need any of that. It takes humility to ask God and to ask somebody else. Can, can I tell you? Now, let me ask you this. I know we're not in summertime, but summertime, um, I, I have this thing in summertime. Me and my wife, we can be in the same ball field outside, backyard, in the middle of summer. Like, we can be in the same spot, and every bug in the county will bite me and not touch her. Come on, where are my people at? Come on, where are all my bug? Eat? I just listen. She's in. I'll just. Tell, she's not here. She's in kids ministry. I tell her it's just because my blood's sweeter than hers. Like I'm just sweet, and so they're just attracted to that. Y'all don't tell her I said that. But nonetheless, so during the summer, do you know what I, I, I live like with like like bug repellent? Like I like off. If there is a bug repellent out there that has been invented, I have bought it. I have used it. I have batteried it. I've got zones of 15 feet. I've got like wristbands, spray, all of that stuff. Why? Because I'm trying to repel these bugs. Can I tell you? 
There is something, whether you mean to or not, that is a God repellent that literally zones off the grace of God on your life. Doesn't matter how much you pray, how much you, it's, you know what it's called? It's called pride. It's called pride. And if you got pride in your heart, God can't anoint pride. God can't give grace to pride. God can't elevate pride. God can't give favor. Look at James chapter 4. Look what it says. James 4 verse 6 says, but he gives us more. Everybody say more. He gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. If you want to repel the spirit of God, just be prideful and arrogant. But if you want more grace, more anointing, more favor, then you, like Jesus, humble yourselves. What does humility look like? More humility looks like more love. More humility looks like more patience. More humility looks like more listening, more forgiveness, more unity, more prayer, more dependency on God. God, I can't do this without you. If my people will humble themselves and pray, God will open up the windows of heaven. And when God elevates you, nobody else can tear you down. Come on, how many know we got to humble ourselves? Destination, God wants to do more in us and through us, but we got to stay humble. It can't be about us. Listen, uh, Wednesday night, God moved in a powerful way. God's going to continue to move in a powerful way. Uh, and some of you were weirded out by some stuff Wednesday night. I'm just going to be honest with you. I want to remind you today when I said Wednesday is that the Holy Spirit's not weird. People are weird. People are weird. Well, pastor, I'm just not sure about Let me Let me give you, and, and you just got to trust me in this, okay, as your pastor. I promise you, when people get weird, I will address the people that get weird. And there will be conversations, maybe side conversations. How, how do you know the difference? It, it's so simple. How do I know if the Holy Spirit's really moving on somebody or not? It's really, really simple. When the Holy Spirit is really moving and really working, all the attention and all the glory and all the focus goes on him. How do you know when someone's not really in the thing? When all the attention and all the focus and all the eyes get on them. If anyone starts to step up and try to get focused, listen, I promise you, your pastor is going to have conversations. Because in this church, God is going to do amazing things. In this church, God is going to provide heal. But at the end of the day, we're going to be like a mirror that says, it's not about me. God, you get all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. Come on, church, can we just give God some praise for all that he's done, all that he continues to do? Give all glory to Jesus. And by the way, when we give more power to God, God gives more power to us. When we reflect it to Jesus, he trusts us. Number two, God will do more when we're more hungry. God will do more when we're more hungry. Let me talk about what hunger is. Hunger is about desire, obsession, and consumption. Now, I, let me kind of reference this to physical hunger, even though that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about hungering for the things of God, thirsting for the things of God. But I, I believe to help you understand it, we all understand the physical. Now, what I mean by that is this. How many of you have ever, be honest, how many of you have ever been so hungry, so hungry you got obsessed? Come on, be real. You, this is what I mean. You were so hungry and there was something you wanted so bad, the Snickers commercial makes you look like a nice guy. And what I mean by that is, if someone gets in the way of what you want, you will push them out of the way to eat what you want. Come on, can I get in? You've been there before, all right? I won't say who, I, I won't say who, but somebody after 10 days of prayer and fasting, uh, you know, and they were, I won't say who, but they were on stage, uh, and they were here really late Wednesday night, um, and, uh, and so they decided to break the fast, and, and they didn't pre-think. I've, I've done fasting long enough. How do you know rookie fast people? Rookie fast people don't prepare their meal before they, they wait. And so I'm not going to say who, but somebody decided to break the fast afterwards and went to Taco Hell. I mean, Taco Bell. They went to Taco Bell <laughs> to break the fast. And, and uh, the next day, I, I was hearing from, I mean, there's no per person in particular. I was hearing, and, and, and he was like, man, I will... I will never, no, one, one, I will never, it's probably a lot, I will never eat Taco Bell ever again, right? Now, how many of you have ever, before we judge whoever that was, let me just say this. How many of us have ever pigged out on something we know we shouldn't have pigged out on, right? 
And we, we just went all in. And as soon as we were done, we said two things. One, I will never eat that again, ever. Number two, I don't even think I'm going to ever eat again. Number two, right? L let me just say this. One of the reasons that God sometimes doesn't fill us is because we're already full. And what I mean by this is we've, we've eaten all the junk and the crap of the world. And then we come in, we're just like, man, I don't think I, I even though I don't think I'll ever eat that again, I don't even know if I'm ever going to eat again. I'm just so, and, and then we wonder why sometimes we come in here, we can't, like, we're so lethar literally lethargic, we can't lift our hands and worship, and not because of something we physically ate, but something that we worldly ate and worldly consumed. And, and we've allowed the enemy to make us just feel like we're just worth nothing and we're, we're no good. Number one, I want you to know, if that's even where you're at today, Jesus doesn't judge you and Jesus loves you just the way you are. I don't care what you've consumed in the world. I don't care what you've smoked. I don't care who you slept with. I don't care what you've done. Jesus isn't here to judge and condemn. But he is here to offer something better for your thirst and for your hunger. Look, look at, there's a story where Jesus met a woman at a well, like literally at a well. Uh, and she was there drawing water out of this well. Uh, and she obviously was thirsty, uh, but Jesus knew she had a different kind of thirst. Uh, and Jesus walks up to this woman who's, who's getting water, and, and Jesus, like, just, like, he's a prophet, so he just knew everything about her before she even said anything. And he said, hey, hey, listen, I know you're getting water for somebody. I just want you to know, um, I, listen, you, you're getting water for a guy that you're not even married with. Matter of fact, this is not even your husband. You've been with so many guys. And, and, and then she just kind of, like, kind of lost and said, also, you're a prophet and a teacher. But Jesus didn't bring all her past up and her current reality up to judge her. Jesus said, listen, I, I get it that you're thirsty, but I've got something for you, living water, that if you'll try what I have, you'll never be thirsty again. See, my, my prayer is for our church and for us, if we want God to do more, we got to have, number one, a desire that turns into an obsession, that turns into a consumption. Can you imagine having a desire for something? You get to a restaurant, you obsess over it, they bring it to you, and then you don't consume it? Can, can I tell you, we got not only to come to church, we got to come with a desire, come with an obsession, come with a hunger, and then when the word of God is free, we got to consume it. But we got to consume it. Do you imagine where we'd be if people like would show up like the woman who had an issue of blood and say, I don't care who gets in my way. I need a word from Jesus. I need a touch from God. I am so hungry and thirsty for the living water. I need God to do something that only God can do. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I, I want a revival, but you can study every revival in the history of revival. There has never been a revival where people weren't first hungry for the things of God. We have got to get so empty of the things of this world, and we got to get a desire and an obsession and a consumption for the things of the Lord. If the only time you consume the word of God is on a Sunday, that is not desire. That is not hunger. If the only time you worship the Lord is on Sunday or pray, come on, how many of you know this thing is something we develop every single day? And I believe as a church gets thirsty, as a church gets hungry for spiritual food, man doesn't live by just bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the voice of God. How many know we will literally pull down heaven into our lives? Come on, how many of you want more? Somebody say made for more. Point number three, not just more humble, more hungry. Point number three, God will do more. When we're more obedient. God will do more when we're more obedient. Any parents out there, like, come on, like, especially if you've got teenagers, any parents out there, um, your kids will, like, will come up to you and, and ask you for something. Like, they want you to bless them. And, it's, you know, can I have some money? Can I go do this? Can I go out there? Can I do that? And, you're, and they're asking for all these things. And you're like, but you haven't done the one thing I asked you to do on Saturday, and it's, and it's like the next Friday. Come on, somebody. Are you with me? Now, some of you aren't clapping because you know where I'm about to go with this. Moms and dads, don't, don't hit your kids right now because I ain't really even talking about them. God, could you bless me? God, could you open up a door for me? God, could you do something more for me? God, could you help promote me? And God's like, you haven't done what I asked you to do 10 years ago. Why would you, why would I do something now? 
I asked you to clean out your room 20 years ago, and you want me to do something now? Can, can I tell you, when we honor and obey our Father, God, God will literally bless us like, like no, nothing less. And, and God's not looking for sacrifice. God says this, I, I want obedience, not sacrifice. God's looking for a church and people who will be radically obedient, radically obedient, that when God speaks, we listen and we do. Look, look at James chapter 1. I love this verse. James 1 says this, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. It's okay if you take notes and clap an amen, but if you walk out and you don't do anything you heard today, you're deceiving yourself. We got to listen to God and do what he says. Can I tell you, every person in the Bible who God greatly used and did more with weren't perfect people. They weren't people who were not without fault. When I think of Abraham, uh, who not only lied several times and slept with someone that wasn't his wife and did all these things, but, but at the end of the day, when God asked Abraham to sacrifice the one thing that he prayed and believed for, and he was willing to do it, can I tell you, God said, all right, there's a guy that will do what I say. I trust him. David was a man after God's own heart, but I thought he was a murderer, a liar. He did all those things. But when God asked David to repent and David to go and David to do, David was a man after God's heart, which means David obeyed when God asked him to do something. Let me ask you this. What's the speed of your obedience when God speaks to you? You, you say, I'll wait, I'll wait till next week. I'll wait tomorrow. I'll wait next year. Can I tell you? Let me just say this. You are one small act of obedience away of God doing more in your life than you're even asking him to do, thinking he can do, praying that he would do. He is a father that loves his kids. He wants to bless his kids, promote his kids, heal his kids. He's just looking for his kids to be obedient kids that will just do what the fathers asked them to do. You want God to do more? Come on, how many you want God to do more? Yeah. Yeah. Then be faithful with what he's already given you. He who is faithful with a little, God will give more. As we wrap up this series today, I think, I think John the Baptist got it right in John 3.30. He must become greater and greater. I must become less and less. He, Jesus, must become greater and greater. See, John the Baptist was preaching, repent and get baptized. Jesus comes along and people actually thought they were uh, in competition. Like they were trying to make John the Baptist greater. And John's like, no, 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 you don't understand. He who's coming after me, I'm not even worthy to like untie and tie his sandals. He, that guy, he's got to get greater and greater and greater. This guy has got to get less, less, Unless you want God to do more, can I tell you, I want God to do more. I need to make Jesus greater and greater, and Brian needs to be less and less. Destination, we need to make Jesus greater and greater, but we've got to become less and less. Here, here's the one thing to do as we wrap up. It's real simple. God will do more when we become less. Less of me equals more of God. What does less of me look like? Humility. What does less of me look like? Hungering for the things of God. What, of, what does less of me look like? Not my will, your will be done. Obedience. We are made for more, more of his presence, more of his provision, and more of his power. Come on, are you ready to receive more? Come on, are you with me? I want you to stand to your feet all across this place today. I want to end with this. You know, Moses, Moses led millions of people out of slavery. They were slaves in the nation of Egypt. God used him, raised him up. God says, Moses, I've got more for you. They did all these miraculous things. God set the people free, took them right out of Egypt, took them to a sea. They've got the army behind them, a sea in front of them. God says, Moses, have some faith. Put out the staff and the sea opened up. They walked across on dry land, closed back over the Egyptian army. Now they're in the wilderness. And can I tell you, just because, number one, just because God set you free from something in your past doesn't mean you gotta believe, can't believe God for something right now. And, and sometimes, just like the people of Israel, they forgot the miracles of God. They trusted God there, but they didn't trust God today. How many know he is the same God? And they got in the wilderness. You know what happened? God had a promised land for them, but in the journey from Egypt to the promised land, guess what they got? They got very prideful, they got very worldly, and they got very disobedient. 
almost to the point where God literally told Moses, Moses, he says, hey, listen, I, I'm gonna keep my promise even when they don't. I'm, I'm gonna send y'all to the promised land. I'm just out. I can't go with you. Because Moses, I don't wanna be with people that don't want me to be with them. I don't wanna walk with people that don't wanna walk with me. I'm not gonna force my blessing on someone who doesn't want to receive it or acknowledge me or give me credit. So, hey, listen, I'm not gonna break my word even though they broke theirs. So I'm gonna send them to the promised land, but I'm just gonna chill here. And Moses, that's why he was the leader. He was pretty wise. He said, God, listen, I'd rather stay in the wilderness with you than go to the promised land without you. I'd rather hang out here in your presence than go anywhere that may look good on the outside. But if you're not there, it's not worth it. And God says, Moses, fine, I, I, I will change my mind. I will go with you. And then Moses said this in Exodus 33, verse 16. Let this kind of seal this set-apart series. Moses says, God, for your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on earth. How many know it is the presence, the power, the spirit of God that makes us different than everybody else? Come on, how many you want more and more of his spirit and presence? You want, you want to hear the saddest reality? All across America, there are hundreds of churches with lots of people and no God. I'd rather be in a church with three people and the presence of God than 3,000 and no God. But how many believe we have both and we can have more of both? We want the Spirit of God. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes all across this place. Let me talk to those first who don't know Jesus today. You're in the perfect place. If you're not right with God, I want you to know because of Jesus, you can be right with God. You have to be born again to get to heaven. What does that mean? The Bible says this, that we were born into sin, but Jesus lived a sinless life, died on a cross, rose from the dead. Romans 10 says, if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, Jesus is Lord, I will be saved. And today it's not by works, it's by faith. Good people don't go to heaven, forgiven people do. Blood of Jesus covers us. Let me ask you, are you right with God? Watching online in the Summocast room or in this auditorium today, I wanna give you a chance. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, it's faith, not works. But I want to count to three. And as a sign of faith, if you're not right with the Lord, but you want to be, I'm just going to ask you to slip your hand up, and you can put it right down, and I'm going to pray with you today. Come on, if that's you. One, two, three. Come on. All the way in the back. I see it. Hands here in the middle. I see hands everywhere. It's so good. Awesome. Over here on my left. Come on, in the Samocast room, raise your hand. All the way in the back. And online, raise your hand. So good. So good. Come on, you can put your hands down. Church, there was literally dozens of hands that went up all over this place. We celebrate that. So Christians pray. If you raised your hand, let me pray with you. It's more about your faith, but just say something like this. I confess with my mouth, Jesus, and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus, be Lord of my life. I repent of my sins. Make heaven my destination. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 I want to pray for us right now. Let me just ask you this question. Do you want more today? Do you want more today? You got to make more room for God to do more. Do you need to get more humble? Do you need to get more hungry? Do you need to get more obedient today? I'm just going to ask that you would open up your hearts with me today as we wrap up this series. I'm just believing that God wants to do more. And if that's you, if you desire more, if you know you were made for more, if you want to see the power of God, the presence of God, I just felt like what the Lord said about 30 days ago to me is that God, almost like a bucket, wanted to pour out more of his presence, more of his provision, more of his power than ever before. But you got to make more room. Come on, if that's you, if you want more of God, I want you to lift your hands all across this place, even online. Samuel Castro, let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want more. God, we want more of your fire. We want more of your spirit. God, we humble ourselves. We pray. We seek your face. God, would you do something in us that only you could do? God, set a fire in our soul even today because we want more. Come on. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching the Destination Church YouTube channel. But don't stop there. Hit the like, the share button, and definitely subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with everything that we want to give you. Hey, if it's impacted your life, please pray about giving financially to help people find their destination in Christ. Hey, just know it's not about where you've been. It's where you're going that matters, and the best is yet to come.